saints I stand and cast a wishful eye to kingdoms fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. Oh, the transporting rapture scene that rises to my sight. Sweet fields of raving, living green, and rivers of delight. I am bound for the promised land, I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me, I am bound for the promised land. Filled with delight, my raptured soul would hear no longer. 
Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this worship service at Union Church Berea on this gorgeous, if rainy, autumn morning. My name is Pastor Nate Craddock and it is my great privilege and honor to be the sabbatical pastor here while our senior pastor, Kent Gilbert, is away on sabbatical. He's coming back in two weeks. So. <laughs> So you have one more week of me next week, uh, and then we'll hand things back off to Kent on November 3rd. Whether you are a visitor or a regular worshiper with us this morning, you are welcome here just as you are. We are so glad that you've chosen to take time out of your weekend to join us in worship. We also want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us online, wherever you are in time or space, you are as much a part of this community as everyone gathered in this room this morning. So to those of you gathered, thank you for your support of this ministry that helps us to extend uh, the hospitality of God to people all over the world. At the end of each pew, you should find a red pew folder, and Jennifer is waving that. So that pew folder will come down your pew during the service. As it comes to you, kindly, Fill out one line with as much contact information as you'd like us to have. That will help us extend our hospitality to you as a community of faith. If this is your first time here, we want you to know that there is a restroom in the vestibule in the back on that side. We also have large print bulletins and hearing assistance devices. If you need help in accessing the service in any way, please ask an usher for that if you need it. There is also a, a, an active worship corner. We call it the children's worship corner, but it's really for people of all ages in the corner back here. You are invited, however old you are, to use that space if you need to get up and move and play and stretch. and However, that would help you engage in worship. And of course, a big part of our worship here at Union is our prayer and action stations, which we'll have an opportunity to participate in later on in the service. That also involves getting up and moving around and praying in different ways. Before we begin worship, there are a few announcements to call your attention to. First off, at 11.45 this morning, immediately after the service, there will be a card-making workshop downstairs in the training room. So you can go downstairs using this, these staircases, or you can go down out these doors. But it'll be in the training room right under here. And that'll be an opportunity for us to come together to make care cards. I'm told there will be snacks. So if you want snacks, that's snack option one. Snack option two is coffee and snacks in the parlor, and you will want to go out these doors, um, so it'll, it's directly that way. You walk by, you can't miss it. So please stay after and join us for some additional hospitality after worship. We are continuing in our annual stewardship campaign this week, and today's celebration is the celebration of our value of thoughtful and intentional faith development. So our scripture and our prayer stations and, and the service itself is focused on this idea of faith development and our sacred story, how we engage with that. And then finally, next week will be our final week of our annual stewardship campaign. And so there are a couple of things to keep in mind with that. First off, that's the day that you should bring your pledge card to church. You will be getting that in the mail this week. Fingers crossed everything goes okay with the post office. Um, and if the government doesn't shut down between now and Friday, you should have your pledge card in the mail. But we will have additional copies here for you on Sunday. But the bigger thing, the more exciting thing, is that after our worship service next week, we'll be having a stewardship celebration barbecue feast. So please plan to come to that. There's going to be way more food than is admissible. Um, so please come hungry to church, but also come ready to celebrate this incredible community as we join together in, in gearing up for another wonderful year of ministry and work, and just in time for Kent to get back. Um, Oh, one other note for next week. If you've been doing the participation challenge, the stewardship participation challenge, uh, 
bring your completed participation challenge calendar. If you haven't gotten one yet, there are some additional copies on the sharing table back here. There are some in the vestibule. You still have time. So 15 challenges completed and a pledge card gets you an entry in a drawing for an Amazon gift card. So just <laughs> something fun to turn this into from homework into a game, right? <clears throat> One additional announcement. Um, the evergreen on the altar this week is for Judy Rao, who passed away at home this past Monday evening. Uh, services will be here at the church on, I believe, Saturday, November 2nd at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and that is all printed in the bulletin as well. During service today, we also hope that you will read and hold in your heart the prayer concerns printed in your bulletin. We are holding in our prayers all our visitors and guests, and in our cycle of prayer for every country and every church here in Berea, especially today the Caribbean, Antigua and Barbuda, Aruba, Bahamas, Barbados, Cuba, Curacao, the Dominica, Dominican Republic, Grenada, Guyana, Haiti, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, San Martin, St. Kitts Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, and our brothers and sisters at Bear Wallow Pentecostal Holiness Church, that the works of God may be the leaven in our loaves and our pearl of great price. Lastly, before we begin worship, we always make a point to light an oil lamp that we call our justice candle. And we light this as a promise of solidarity and prayer and action in support of justice causes around the world. This week, we are lighting this lamp in solidarity with all those who are suffering the effects of political unrest and violence in the Middle East, especially northeast, uh, northwest Syria, right along the Syria-Turkey border, where there is a lot of unrest happening right now. And so we join our hearts in prayer and promise to act in support of those people who are in harm's way, uh, given the political situation right there. And so now I invite us to breathe deeply and to find a place of quiet centeredness as we enter into worship with our prelude. Thank you. I have no idea where I am going. 
I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have the desire in all I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Some of us wonder what this faith thing is all about and come hoping to learn things that are useful, things that are soulful. While some of us come confident in what we have learned and what we've believed, God writes sacred texts in scripture and on our hearts, and in endless subtle ways, God welcomes us into the house of wisdom. So bring your questions, bring your doubts, Bring your faith, bring your entire self, trusting that God meets us here and leads us into the mystery of love while equipping us for every good work. As we gather, let us ask that the Holy One join our desire to learn with God's willingness to teach us in this school of justice and joy. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to number 50 and stand as we join together in singing our opening hymn.
come to this sanctuary are welcome companions on this day. You are invited to turn to those nearest you and greet them with words of peace and hospitality. you continue in what you have learned and firmly believed 
knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent whether time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. Carry out your ministry fully. The word of God for the people of God. I'd like to invite our children to come forward for the children's sermon. like three more bars of vamping. <laughs> hey, how are you? <sighs> Do you all know how to read? You know how to read? Okay, well I was wondering, would one of you like to help me read the gospel lesson today? The Bible story for today? That's totally fine. You don't have to because God gives e to each of us different gifts. <laughs> of course, I, the way I prepared the children's sermon, there was a tee up for somebody wanted to read it. Miss Maria, I wonder if you would be willing to help me read today's Bible story. Sure. Um, okay, so it starts right at the number 18 there. Oh, it's not going to happen. Why is it not going to happen? It's in a language I don't understand. It's in a language you don't understand. What language might it be? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think. Oh, yeah, you know what? I brought my Greek Bible with me to church today. So how many of you know what language the Bible, well, parts of the Bible were written in? Greek, exactly, right. And did you know that you... It, in the olden days, ages and ages and ages ago, most people couldn't read to begin with. And if you could read, chances are you didn't know how to read Greek. Do you wanna, do you wanna see this and see what it looks like? So there are some letters, well, let me see. Oh, I lost today's uh, reading here. So there are some letters that look kind of like English letters, right? So that E kind of looks like an E. That looks like an upside down Y, that's an L. <laughs> the V is an N. This thing right here, that's a completely different letter, but that's a D. And then R is written like P. So if this was the only Bible that you had to read, do you think you'd be able to read it? No, unless you, you would learn how to read it. You'd be one of those cool kids like me who took languages that nobody speaks in high school. <laughs> Oh, you're giving it, you're giving it your best uh, college try right there. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, this is a special edition of the Greek Bible that has a glossary down at the bottom to help people who are trying to learn how to read Greek. But you and I, and Miss Maria, and all of us here benefit from the work of people who, uh, who took the time to learn how to read Greek and translate the Bible into our own language into English, right? And all around the world, there are people who are able to read what this has. They're able to read our Bible stories just because somebody did the work of 
sitting in a really boring classroom for a long time and memorizing a bunch of stuff about a language nobody uses so that we could get the Bible. And for that, that's something I'm grateful for because reading in Greek is hard, even if I can do it, it still, it takes a long time, it's hard. So sometimes we'll say that, so Jesus says we should love God with all our heart and soul and what else does Jesus say we should love God with? Anyone, anyone out there can chime in with our mind and with our strength, right? So sometimes one of the ways that we love God with our mind is just by reading, reading the thing, reading the book and knowing what's in here. And we get to do that in English. One, because we can read. So we're grateful to teachers who promote literacy education, <laughs> but we're also grateful to people who do the work of translating. So that means you get to learn the stories and you get to tell the stories to people in your life as you grow up, which is pretty cool. You like my socks? I'm wearing my, I'm wearing my spooky season socks today. My witch socks. <laughs> what should we pray for this week? Oh, those are really good spooky season socks too. They have ghosts on them. And those are purple. That's nice too. <laughs> what should we pray for this week? You don't know? It's, it's okay not to have something that you want to say. We call those things unspoken prayer requests. <laughs> Miss Maria, anything you think we should pray for this week? People without homes now that it's getting colder outside. People without homes now that it's getting colder outside. You know, one of the cool things that Union Church does with some other churches in the community is that we do this thing called Room in the Inn, where people who don't have homes can come stay in our, in our community room and get a hot meal and a mattress to sleep on, and they can get their laundry taken care of, and they get to just come in out of the cold. So that's one of the really cool things about being at this church, that so we directly get to help people who don't have homes. So we'll, we'll pray for them, and we'll pray for you, and we'll pray for... Uh, and pray for the huge jar to get filled with pennies next week. Remember the, the loose change challenge, grown-ups, clean out your car cup holders. Um, so we'll pray for that too, so we can do more cool things for the people that God loves. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these kids, and we thank you that we get to read your stories in the language we actually speak. We uh, thank you for these young leaders who are growing into your image, and we pray for all of those people who don't have homes as it's getting colder outside, that they can find welcome, they can find safe, warm places to sleep, and that we, as your people, can help that happen. God, we love you and we thank you, and it's in your good name we pray. Amen. All right. Today's Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Elegen de parabole altois prosta den pan pote prosciu hestai altois kai me in kakein. I'm sorry, that's, that's the Greek one. I couldn't resist that really easy dad joke. Thank you for <laughs> enduring that. Jesus told his disciples a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. 
And will not grant God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, God will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? My friends, grace, peace, and mercy are yours from the triune God. Amen. So there are only a few things in my life that have rightfully earned the title of greatest thing ever to happen to me. And one of them is Wikipedia. For a nerdy, non-athletic kid in high school, to have the entire world's entire repository of knowledge at my fingertips was life-changing. Absolutely life-changing. And, and still today, I, get, I fall into what I call the Wikipedia hole, right? And if any of you have been on Wikipedia, because all of the articles are interlinked with each other. So you go to one thing, and then 30 minutes later, you're on a subject that's completely unrelated to the thing that you went to read about, the thing that you went to look up. And uh, I, I have lost multiple hours of my life that way. <laughs> And I'm okay with that because of the work that, uh, the work that goes into creating this repository of wisdom. The thing about Wikipedia is that it is editable, editable by anyone. And that's one of the reasons academics say, well, maybe you shouldn't use Wikipedia as a primary source, which I agree with. So for all the Berea professors in the, in the congregation, please don't have a coronary right now that I'm recommending Wikipedia as a source. Um, but Wikipedia is not without quality control. There are groups of volunteer scholars, there are groups in charge of different subject areas that kind of police Wikipedia, right, to make sure that the sources that are being used to create the articles are actually up to scholarly standards. And every now and then you'll go onto an article maybe that's not as well written, and it'll say, this article could use some TLC, <laughs> this article needs some help, this one isn't up to scholarly standards. And then there's my favorite thing, um, where there will be a sentence written about a particular topic, and then Sometimes you'll just see this little blue superscript link that says, citation needed. Citation needed. And having judged, un having judged, <laughs> having graded undergraduate uh, research papers, the phrase citation needed is one of my, my favorite phrases in the English language. Citation needed. The information age presents us with ample opportunity to learn, to grow, to explore the world, to learn things about places that in the ordinary course of our lives we would never go, to learn things about people we would ordinarily never meet, to learn stories and myths and other ways of seeing the world, and for that I am truly, truly grateful. But every now and then, we see something, I see something for sure, I'll see, if it, I'll see something that uh, raises my eyebrows and makes me say, mm, citation needed. Citation needed. News and social media, of course, are one of the main fora where <laughs> Uh, those citations would do a lot of good, um, especially on social media. Those of us who have that one racist relative who will like repost chain letters about a street gang from New York wanting to take over the Berea Walmart. Mm, citation needed, right? By the way, if you don't know what Snopes is, that's a website that you should know the next time you see someone posting about MS-13 trying to take over the Berea Walmart. Fact-checking, right? But the reality is that a lot of times churches could use some citations too, right? Yes or no is the following phrase in the Bible, God helps those who help themselves. No, it's not, right? But there are not a few people who have been told that that is in the Bible, who have been told that that is part of Christian theology. It's not <laughs> citation needed, right? And sometimes we get situations where people are just projecting their stuff onto God, right? 
well, I think God helps those who help themselves. That seems to be a projection onto God. We assume that, you know, well, I worked hard for the things that I have, and therefore I think that God should be like that too, and so I'm going to project my stuff and my priorities onto God. Sometimes it's kind of a name like that. But sometimes it gets a little bit more damaging, and that's actually the history of racism and slavery in the United States. The Bible was used all over the place in the American South to justify the practice of chattel slavery, right? And that is nothing if not a projection of white supremacy onto the Bible, a projection of white supremacy and fear onto God. And the thing is, a lot of times when we see troubling theology, when we see theologies of exclusion, when we see churches preaching a, a gospel of you're not good enough as you are for God to like you, so you need to figure that out, and then you get to be part of the church, often they're, they're, they're doing this with all of their sources cited, right? They're doing this with all of their dead Europeans correctly cited in Chicago Turabian format in the endnotes. They're doing everything right. And then we come along and we say, well, they cited their sources, but that still doesn't, mm, that doesn't sound true. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. How do we handle that? How do we navigate a world where there are so many competing theologies, where there are so many competing ways of engaging with our sacred story? One of the challenges to this is the reality of confirmation bias. And the, the writer who calls themselves Paul, writing this letter to Timothy, describes confirmation bias in these words. Folks accumulate teachers for themselves who satisfy their itching ears and wander away to myths. We as humans have a natural tendency to accumulate teachers that satisfy what we want to hear, our itching ears. Oh, just scratch that itch, yeah? And so if you go to the footnotes or the endnotes of these kind of really loud theological pronouncements about how uh, LGBT humans might be second-class citizens or how women shouldn't preach or anything like that, you know, there will be all of these teachers cited that are satisfying itching ears. The reality is that it's a very human propensity. It's a very human desire to have sources that satisfy what we want to hear. Because neuroscience has shown us that when we encounter information that runs contrary to what we believe, we have the same physiological and neurological response as if we're being attacked by a bear. So you read something off of Fox News and your blood pressure increases. You're having the same physiological response as though a bear is charging at you in the woods, right? And so we, we seek out information that makes us feel safe. And when we encounter that kind of information, our first response usually isn't thoughtful consideration. It's usually to get on the internet and yell at strangers in comment sections. The funny thing is, though, that, you know, this, this, this byword, you know, wandering away to myths, is the exact brush that a lot of conservative Christianity would want to paint progressive Christianity with. We all do this. We're always painting other people with this broad brush of wandering away towards myths. And I think partially there are, there are some spaces within the progressive Christian world that behaves as though what we individually believe, whatever our theology is, that doesn't matter. You know, believe whatever you want. It's really how you treat people. And I would say that, in part, I think that's true. I think there is some good to keeping theology and keeping our beliefs, keeping our mental furniture arranged, you know, the power that that has, giving that no more power than it deserves, right? But whenever I hear 
that suggestion that what we believe doesn't matter, that our theology doesn't matter as much as our practice, I push back a little bit because the reality is what we believe about God impacts how we treat people made in the image of God. What we believe about other humans impacts the way that we treat them, and those beliefs are formed through engagement with scripture, they're informed through reason, they're informed through tradition, and if any of you are Methodists in the audience, you know that the last word I'm gonna say is that they're formed through experience. Our faith is formed through scripture and through reason and tradition and through experience and the way that we have been formed impacts how we extend hands and love to our neighbor. Are there conditions attached? Is there a checklist that somebody has to complete in order to be recipients of our goodwill? of our hospitality. In case, it's, in case I've not made myself clear, what I'm not suggesting is that everybody needs to have a doctrinal statement that you sign off on, right? I'm not asking us to have our mental furniture all decorated and arranged the same way. But what I am suggesting is that thinking deeply about the stories that we've inherited Thinking deeply about what it is that we believe is important for our life and our work as a community of people who is trying to make the world whole, following the pattern of Jesus, right? Just because we have freedom of conscience does not mean we are exempt from using our noodles. It does not mean that we get to just love our neighbors and leave it at that, because so much of the work does happen in the world of words and of ideas and of opinions. And as I suggested to the kids, we as Christian people have the responsibility to love God and love our neighbor with our minds as well. One of the great tragedies of modernism is the suggestion that mind, rational thinking, and heart or compassion, or emotion, or soul realities, that those two things are enemies, that those two things work against each other, that if we are moved with compassion for someone, we're clearly not thinking rationally. But I'm here to tell you, God doesn't make people in, uh, in, in like Ikea furniture, where you have to fit the parts together correctly, right? You can't just get rid of one of the parts. God makes us whole, head and heart, together. And so part of the work of being a community above love and justice and hospitality and inclusion is to understand how our heads and our hearts work together within the community to make that beloved community manifest. We have the responsibility to know our stories to know who God is, to think deeply about the way that God's story shapes our story, because the Bible is our inheritance too, right? And as we do that, we do have the responsibility to cite our sources. Because doing theology is kind of like editing Wikipedia. Anyone can edit Wikipedia. Anyone can offer something that contributes depth and meaning and wisdom. But at the same time, anyone can slap God's name on their particular idea and call it divine, call it truth, call it whatever they want it to be, but only by knowing who God is like. And spoiler alert, God is like Jesus, compassionate, kind, patient, hospitable. God is the kind of God who reaches across boundaries to welcome us to the table of plenty. God is the God who will not be content to let death or hatred or enmity separate us from divine love, but rather goes into death itself to find us. That's who we know God to be. We know that through our stories, and we know that through our lived experiences. And only by knowing who God is, that God is like Jesus, will we recognize and develop our own scholarly intuition and be able to say, 
well, you're saying that God doesn't like people who are the, a different color from you, so I'm going to need you to cite that source. Friends, the stories that we inherit in Scripture and the stories that we live out as a community of faith are what the Bible calls inspired. And literally, <laughs> in Greek, that word implies God-breathed. God breathed. God breathed those sacred stories for us, for our edification. And as we live these sacred stories out, as we tell the sacred story of Union Church, God is breathing us out into the world. And when God breathes, things come to life. When God breathes, things come to life. And so as God breathes us out into the world, and as we live up to our sacred responsibility of handling this story, of living it, of experiencing it, and of sharing it with those around us in our actions, and in our words, and in our advocacy, and in our solidarity, and in our justice work, we see that God breathing out our story is one of the many, many ways in which God brings life to this world anew. So as God breathes us, let us go and let us know our sources deeply. Let us know our story deeply and be at work in healing the world. Amen. I'd like to thank Reverend Nate for asking me to come up here and talk about faith development this morning. Um, over the last eight years, I've had the privilege of being uh, Union Church's youth director. And uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about my experience with faith development with you all this morning. In our beautifully articulated mission statement, Union Church commits to thoughtful, inspirational, and intentional faith development. We commit to deliver this to every age, to do so with creative teaching and leadership that inspires and equips us to live out justice, compassion, love, and joy. Make no mistake, this is a bold statement, one that is not easy to achieve. It requires that committed people work diligently out in front and behind the scenes to develop programs, organize events, connect people, and lead. These leaders have to take a hard look at their own faith so that they can pass along what they learn and live out to others. As I look back at my own faith journey, I finally remember the mentors that I had. From a very early age, People have stepped forward to help guide my faith journey. Pastors, Sunday school leaders, youth leaders, scout leaders, a host of caring people, young and old. As I have moved through my life, stepping into new stages and new places, new roles, these people have been there. Passing the torch and making sure that I had what I needed to develop and renew my faith. Over the past 13 years of my life, most of these workers have been right here at Union Church. Reverend Kent, Reverend Rachel, Wendy Holbrook, Carla Gilbert, Kevin Burke, Michelle Tooley. There are many of you sitting in this sanctuary right now who have been there with me, and there are many who have moved on. Over the past eight years, I've had the privilege of working with exceptional people on the Faith Development Board, on Church Council, in my role as a youth director, 
While we have worked together to develop the faith of others, they have quietly been developing mine. In my view, to make this work the work of few is to fall short of our commitment. We need leaders and doers of every age and background to put themselves forward as part of this work, part of developing the programs that feed the spirits of this community. Working as a team, as a community, we generate diversity, accountability, creativity, and sustainability. In my eight years of service as youth director, I have found that in order to feed somebody's spirit, you have to connect to them, to get to know them, meet them where they are at, become familiar with their lives, work patiently with them, and truly value them as a child of God. Only then can you share what it means to live out faith, to live out justice, compassion, and joy. You constantly have to consider what these things mean in their lives. How do they connect to that fragile, deeper place? Again, this cannot be the work of few. To connect with someone takes thoughtfulness, inspiration, intention, and that most valuable and elusive piece of our lives, which is time. Time being what it is, each of us only have so much to give. It is precious. So we must all give and give some or give in other ways so that we can sustain and grow the work of faith development in this church. We here at Union Church have been so fortunate in the people that have stepped up to lead faith development, volunteers and staff alike. They have given us much of themselves to see this work done. Some have moved on, and we owe it to this community of faith and to ourselves to fill in their shoes. May we do so thoughtfully, inspirationally, and intentionally. Thank you. We now have the privilege of moving into our prayer and action time. And as you make your way around this week's stations, all of which are described in the bulletin, I invite you to hold in your heart a prayer that God make the story come alive anew for us as a community of faith. As we pray, we'll also be collecting this week's offering. Um, if you are interested in joining with us in the work that Union Church is doing in the world, you have the opportunity to do that financially. And many of us give in other ways, uh, whether you give online or whether you give through time or service. If participating in this, uh, this communal celebration of our offering is important to you, please use one of the laminated cards in the pew and pop that in the offering basket when it comes around because we all contribute to this beloved community together. And so let us be in prayer.
seated. Divine One, from whom we seek a way to live that honors you, come and remind us of the law you have written on our hearts. God of our being, enter us by your spirit and show us how sweet your words are. Holy One of our yearning, bring your comfort and strength to this gathering that we may all partake of your wondrous love and welcome you to our lives. As you tutor us in the well-worn rhythms of grace, keep us ever mindful of your presence that meets us in each person and holds this world together. Open our hearts to service, to justice, and to joy, as you make your beloved community manifest here in this time once more. All these things we ask in your good name, as we join our voices to that of your Son, our teacher, who taught us to pray, our maker, our mother, and our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to our closing hymn number 266 and stand as we joyfully join our voices to sing together. short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way alongside us. So once again, be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the blessing of God who creates, redeems, and sanctifies be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>